You're watching Keystone Science, and in today's episode, we're going to build a plasma chandelier. Now before we get started, this video is made possible by PCBWay. Now I've gotten many boards from PCBWay before. It's basically a service that allows you to submit your circuit drawing and then it gets printed out on a PCB board, which is an actual circuit board. So then you can put your components on it and it just looks so beautiful. The quality is so great. Not only that, the prices are extremely low and the turnover time is impeccable. In fact, to get 10 PCBs that are two layers each, it'll cost $5 and the build time is only 24 hours. So it's really amazing. They also offer all kinds of services such as PCB assembly and PCB design. And also, between you and me, they've been extremely nice to me. I'm so patient as I've taken a while to get these videos out going through university. So if you guys have an electronics project that you just want to look beautiful, then go ahead and check them out because nothing feels more satisfying than having your own circuit printed on a PCB board. So a little bit of a, a little bit of things to say beforehand, I'm now done with university. I just barely graduated in mathematics and physics uh, with a minor in CS, and so here we are. So we've been doing a lot of like pure physics experimentation recently and I kind of want to get back to doing some more just high voltage random fun projects just to like let loose a little bit I guess. And so I walked in here earlier today and I found this old chandelier. It's kind of cool. It has five bulb slots and I was thinking it'd be really cool if each of these were plasma bulbs. So that's the plan for today. We'll see if it actually works. Now you may remember in a previous video that I actually made a plasma bulb before. So that circuit is actually right back here. This guy here, this is going to be high voltage when I turn it on. I'm attaching it to my chicken stick, which is really just a screwdriver, but potato potato. You can start to see these little streamers pop off, kind of like a regular plasma ball. So that's really what we're going after here. And in the dark, of course, it looks much, much cooler than that. But effectively, we're just trying to get this plasma ball effect. Now, so you guys can see the difference between the frequencies. I have it set to 10 volts. I'm going to be touching the light bulb like this. So you guys can watch what happens inside of it. Now watch as I change the frequency on the 555 timer. You can see as I get lower, we get streamers coming off much earlier. So it seems to be performing better at lower frequencies. And keep in mind, that was only at 10 volts. And I plan to end up driving this thing at around 20 or 25 volts. I just need to get heat sinks and such in place since this makes the MOSFET already get quite hot since we're putting near an amp of current through it. Now you may think that's neat and you wouldn't be wrong, but I would like to give this thing a little bit of a modernization because this 555 timer circuit, although one of my favorite circuits, is a little bit dated. So given how cheap it is to get microprocessors, I'm going to try to set this thing up with an Arduino, which if you haven't learned how to code, this is a great little introduction to learning how to code anyways. It's not really much coding, it's like a few lines, but you'll see. If you haven't seen them before, Arduinos are these little microprocessors with all these little pins you can connect up to for the different functions you write. They're very convenient and very cheap, uh, especially if you get the knockoff ones like I do. This is only about $2 on eBay. So the bulk of doing this is just writing a little bit of code. So let me grab my laptop and we'll see what we can do. I'm going to use a library called Timer1, which makes it so you can choose a pin and then set the period in microseconds that the square wave will be output on for that pin. And so you can choose all the way up to like one microsecond, I think. It just gets less and less like a square wave and more and more like sinusoidal noise. But doing it like this, we can achieve much higher frequencies than we're able to achieve by doing the set high, delay one, set low, delay one, or something like that. Okay, let's jump right into the code for this Arduino. So the first thing I'm going to do inside of the Arduino code is I'm going to include the timer uh, one dot h. And this is the library that I imported a bit ago uh, that will give us the ability to set the frequency on one of the pins. So one thing that I'd like for this to be able to do, especially for testing right off, is to be able to change the frequency around to different values. So I'm going to do that with a potentiometer. So I'm going to do um, int pot pin in honor of 420, and I'm going to set that equal to 3. 2. I'll set that equal to 2. Now inside the setup so I can monitor a few things, I'm going to type in serial.begin um, and then a baud rate of 9600, which is just traditional for regular USBs. That's a very good thing to uh, assume that it is. Now we are going to need to be able to read a value from that potentiometer, or kind of read the voltage across that potentiometer. I'll show you guys in a second. So I'm going to type in int value up here, um, and that just stores an integer value. And then down here I'm going to say value equals analog ana analog read and then we're going to do the pot pin. 
So now let's take this potentiometer and let's connect it up to the Arduino. If you don't know what a potentiometer is, uh, basically it's a variable resistor. So what we have here are the two ends of a resistor, then the middle one is like a little sweeper pin that you can sweep along it. Um, and so that changes the resistance that the electrons have when flowing through the circuit. So as the diagram that I have on screen shows, I'm going to connect one end of my potentiometer to the 5 volt supply. I'm going to connect the other end to ground, and I'm going to connect the middle pin to A2. Since that's the pin that I specified, I said that the pot pin would be pin number two. So that's analog in number two. So now with that connected up, I'm going to plug the Arduino into my computer. You can see it light up there. Within tools, I'm going to set the port to the correct USB port, which this one is COM7. Now I can go ahead and upload this. So now that it's done uploading, if I go into tools and I click on serial monitor, we can see that it should be, there we go, that it's outputting some value. And so as I turn the potentiometer here, you can see I can get it to go to zero. And if I turn it the other way, it'll go to 1023. Eventually, this value that we're reading, this value from the analog read here, that's going to be written into a frequency, or into a period that we're going to pass into the timer1 function uh, to then get out a frequency onto another pin. So I'm going to create a function down here, which is just basically something that takes an input and does something with that input. So I'm going to call this function uh, pot to frequency. Sure. And its input will be an integer and it will be val. So this function is effectively going to be one that takes the value red and it's going to use that to set the frequency on a certain pin. So let's choose a pin here. It needs to be one of the PWM pins. And I'm going to set that equal to 9 because I'm going to be using pin 9. So that means in the setup I'm going to want to specify pin mode uh, freak pin as output. So as is kind of self-explanatory, this function sets pin 9 as an output pin. So down inside of here, I'm going to want to type in timer1.initialize, and then I'm going to say val. So that will set a timer on the frequency determined by val, where val is the period in microseconds. Uh, val is period in microseconds. Now if I type in timer1.pwm, and then freak pin. It's going to set that frequency we initialized here as the output frequency on this pin here. Now you may have noticed as we were looking at it, the value here can be zero, and so with a period of zero, that would mean a frequency of infinity, which I don't think the Arduino could handle. So I'm going to go ahead and make an int period is equal to val plus one for now. And then here, I'm going to set that equal to period, because this is the period in microseconds, which means if this were to be 10 here, so 10 microseconds, then we would be having 100,000 hertz. And so that means for ours, as we're turning it with a value equal to zero, this gets an input and a transformation to one megahertz, and with the value at the max, it's around 1,000 hertz. Now, we really don't need that really high frequency. In fact, our uh, Goldilocks zone for this per se is probably going to be between 200 and 100 um, Which means I am going to do some remapping here So there are a lot of different ways that we can do remapping on this since I really only care about the range from like 10 to 250 What I'm going to do is that period is equal to value mod 250 plus 1 so effectively what modular arithmetic does is that it will take the value, it will divide it by 250, and then the remainder will be the output of this little area here, and then I'll be adding one to it to make sure I never get that zero I was talking about earlier. Now to show you guys that it is producing a frequency, I have the speaker connected from pin 9 to the speaker, and then the other end of the speaker going to the ground connection here, and so most of this is obviously in the uh, inaudible range, since it goes up to 100,000 hertz, and I doubt that the uh, speaker could even compensate for that, but as I turn it, you can hear and keep in mind, we have a modular function here, so it should do the same sweep over and over and over. As I turn it up, you can see that the frequency is indeed changing and going through that same little, uh, same little sweep there. So now the plan is kind of simple. I'm going to take the output and attach it to this MOSFET here. Now, if you don't know what a MOSFET is, it's essentially like a little electronic switch. Meaning, if I give it signal on one of these pins, uh, then it will open up the way for electricity to flow through the other pins. So, if I connect the output of my frequency generator to this pin, which is known as the gate, and connect the other pin over here to the 
source, then right now this MOSFET should be turning off and on at that frequency we saw a moment ago. So, now with our lovely ignition coil, I am going to connect this red wire to the power supply. This other wire here is going to connect from the other end of the ignition coil, the ignition coil transformer, um, over here to the drain of the MOSFET. And then the negative or ground of the power supply is going to be connected up to the same spot as the uh, ground of the Arduino here. So I'm going to bring down this guy, this is the uh, test light bulb that I've been using, and I'm going to connect its wire up to that same common ground. Let's go ahead and turn this on at a low voltage and see what happens. I am getting something, ooh, that's kinda neat. Look at that. And as you can see when I come close to the plasma bulb here, uh, we get a pretty beautiful little light show. Oh, and it looks so beautiful. There's so much ozone coming out here. Now that I feel, admittedly, a little bit more optimistic about what's going on with the plasma ball, especially since we can do it with an Arduino, that is so nice, because these 5 5 timers can be pretty finicky sometimes. I want to turn back and focus a little bit more on the physical chandelier itself. Now, I'm not exactly sure, but I'm assuming it's fed directly from the ends of this cable here, so let me rip those off. There we go, we have an end of the cable. Um, in order to test this, I'm just gonna go ahead and connect it up to the high voltage, see what happens. Okay, so now comes the moment of truth. I'm gonna flip on the power supply, and I'm gonna turn it up. Welp, kids, now we know that the high voltage uh, cannot be stopped by the wires inside of this, and it will just hurt. Okay, wonderful. We're still getting the nice plasma bulbs coming on. Uh, I don't really want to be touching this, but it is coming out. And I assume that will get better with frequency, because before it was getting better at different frequency. So there are obviously some frequencies that work and some frequencies that don't, um, as you can see here. So we'll be playing around with that a little bit more later on. So we're going to start by trying to mount this ignition coil, which I don't want to put just like this, because in here is where the wires are that go onto these outlets, and the wires are going to be where I'm going to put the uh, high voltage. So rather, I'm going to cut out a little piece of wood that protrudes from the surface, and I'm going to mount the ignition coil onto that, so that hopefully it should be isolated enough from the rest of the system. Now I would also like to have the Arduino on the wood on the chandelier, uh, however I was also a little bit worried that it would get shocked, so I 3D printed out this little case for the Arduino, and I designed up this little guy here, so that I can put this over the wood and then glue the Arduino on top of here, and it will just hold it into place. Now both the little wood support we put in for this ignition coil, and the Arduino holder are both glued into place. So, we can get working on the rest of it. So the plan right now is to have this cap onto the end here, and then have this high voltage wire soldered up to the line wire that originally goes down to each of these uh, light bulb fixtures. So really quickly, I'm gonna go ahead and solder that up. Alright, so now I have this little high voltage coil that goes from the ignition coil up to the main wiring of the uh, sockets for the lights. So now, I bought this little uh, wire protective tubing. So the hope is that for the wiring that has to deal with the Arduino and stuff, this should keep it fairly insulated from the rest of the guy. Okay, so now one of the more complicated parts, and that's gonna be figuring out where to put all the wiring for this thing. So I would like it if both the Arduino and the ignition coil ran off the same power supply, but Arduinos typically run on a range from 5 volts to 20 volts, with the premium uh, range being from 7 volts to 12 volts, about. Because if you have it too high, then it may burn out the voltage regulator too low, and the Arduino may be unstable. Now, luckily, voltage regulators are really simple to implement. In fact, I have one already implemented back here that I can show you guys. So on this little board, I have it implemented up to the schematic representation. However, I don't have the capacitors in it. The capacitors really would help for it to be a more smooth transition, effectively. You can see when I turn it on, uh, at around 5 volts, we have a little bit less than optimal. But now, as I go up, now we're at 10 volts, it's still around 5 volts on the multimeter here. And similarly, as I turn this power supply up, now to 20 volts, it's still 5 volts here. And even all the way up, here it starts getting a little bit unstable because it's not made for these higher voltage ranges of 32, but you can see it is still 5.06 volts, so it's really close. So this little voltage regulator will work perfectly for keeping the Arduino happy. And since there's not much power going into the Arduino, we don't really have to worry about putting a heat sink on it. Now, I may be wrong, but it's probably not super useful for me going through and videoing me uh, just connecting up all these wires, since you already know how the circuit works, and I'm just going to be optimizing it to fit around the chandelier. But effectively what I'm going to be doing is taking a red wire and a black wire, uh, that's going to be fed up through this chain here, 
and it's going to be spliced to go over to the Arduino voltage regulator that we just made and the ignition coil here. Um, and the black wire is just going to be going back to the ground so that then on the other end of the chain, on the bottom of the chandelier, or the top, I guess, uh, you can connect up whatever power supply you like. And we'll play around with the power supplies later on to see which one works best. So yeah, I'm just going to work on that really quickly. Okay, so I've wired it all up to the chandelier and this is what we have. So you can see the Arduino, of course, in its case, the high voltage coil in its high voltage place, each of the five light bulbs, as well as all the wiring for it done within this little flexible wire protector cable that I found at the store. Similarly, I have some of this wire protector around each of these light bulb parts because I don't want the high voltage to be leaking off onto the Arduino or the MOSFET. And finally, it's all done so that it's powered off of these two cables here, the positive and the negative, to power the whole thing, and that runs up the chain. So one thing I think that will help this whole project is if I add grounded wires around each of these light bulbs. That way it'll kind of promote it to be glowing a little bit more inside of each of these. So I'm gonna go ahead and add that. Well, it looks a little bit shoddy, but I think I like it. And I'm pretty sure that's the final wire I have to attach. So here's some red wine vinegar to celebrate. Mm. All right. Let's go ahead and connect this up to some power. Okay, now I'm going to go ahead and turn on the power for the first time. I had to do the voiceover for this part externally because the interference that this thing caused inside the microphone was so intense that you couldn't hear a single thing I was saying. Now one of these bulbs has a filament inside of it and it's the one that's flaring up a lot. The rest of them only have a little bit of metal exposed to the outside of the bulb. If I put my hand on top of the bulb, it's not hurting my fingers at all, I don't feel any tingling, but it is still getting the plasma streams as you'd see in a traditional plasma ball. This thing is producing a ton of ozone, I can smell it everywhere inside the room. One final neat thing that you'll find with most kinds of plasma balls is that if you put a fluorescent light bulb next to it, the light bulb will light up, similarly if you do like a neon tube. This is because the high frequency, high voltage fields around the bulb are enough to excite the molecules inside of it to emit light. You see a similar phenomenon when you hold a fluorescent tube underneath a large power line, like the ones that go state to state that carry just a ton of current through them. So there you have it, the plasma ball chandelier. So that about sums it up for this video. Thank you guys for watching. Oh, and here is a dog. Anyways, thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. Sorry, he is really sleepy. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, I'd really appreciate it if you'd give it a thumbs up. And if you want to see content like this every week, then go ahead and hit the subscribe button. If you have any suggestions for future videos you'd like to see, then leave it in the comment section below and I'll try to get back to you as soon as I can. And so, that's everything. Be sure to be safe and have a wonderful day. See you guys next time. You're watching Keystone Science, and in today's episode we're going to be building a Michelson interferometer and using it to measure the wavelength of light.